Well, first of all, uh, as is always appropriate, I want to thank Esalen Institute for providing a forum for this kind of interchange. There are very few places and fewer and fewer places in the country where an absolutely unconditional discourse can take place. And uh, they not only uh, tolerate what I do here, they encourage what I do here. I'm, uh, I've been here since the first of the month as the scholar in residence, which is a new program at Esalen where they bring in people who have been here many times before and just let them live for a month here and interact chiefly with the uh, people who work here. So I've been warming up for you for a good three weeks, and uh, I think I'm ready. I hope I'm ready. Um, I don't know. I think tomorrow, when we let it settle out, I will get feedback from each of you, because so many people are not here right now. I should introduce myself. There may be people here who have never been exposed to this stuff. Some people come to Esalen and decide after they get here what they will take based on examining the catalog. And to those poor souls, uh, <laughs> we say, welcome and hang on. Well, I've been, I've been off the talk circuit for about six or seven months because I've been writing a book that uh, was something I'd wanted to do for a long time. Now this evening really initiates the beginning of a new series of uh, public lectures and travels. Those of you who are old timers to this material, if you look closely there are small new wrinkles. Um, those of you who aren't familiar with it, um, this is the state of the art to my ability to put it across. Tonight I just thought I would go over the themes or the memes or the concerns that this weekend will orbit around. Looking at the number of people who are familiar with this kind of thing, I assume that the dialogue or the, the event will be largely driven by questions because all these graduate students uh, know that if they don't ask questions, I will just repeat myself, and they've heard it already. So uh, feel free to ask questions. Feel free to uh, interrupt. If you're signaling that you want to interrupt and I'm not noticing you, I'm noticing you. I just have to somehow put it together in a certain way before I can stop and let you get in. So, you know, I, I, I do see you, but sometimes I get up ahead of steam and then I can't pull out of the power dive uh, immediately. <clears throat> well, um, we meet, as we always have, in an atmosphere of deepening planetary crisis. Each time we meet, the planetary crisis appears to have been notched slightly tighter. Uh, what we now have uh, in tatters behind us is any naivete that we may have built up about the potential for large masses of people to force nonviolent social change. Uh, we've had a thorough lesson in the foolishness of entertaining that idea in the last month. Uh, even since the last time I spoke to most of you, the assessment of uh, the state of the atmosphere, the amount of pollutants being pumped into it from tropical burning of forest and grassland has been drastically increased. They dangle the chimerical hope of cold fusion in front of us, and I didn't even have time to publicly gloat over it before it was snatched away from us again, and we were returned back to the world of real energy politics. 
so planetary crisis and uh, I'm going to talk a lot about this what is happening in my own evolution as I try to refine this over and over for uh, audiences like yourselves and try and write it now into book form for larger audiences is a, a sense that what were disparate obsessions of mine were in fact a unified whole that only my unconscious mind fully grasped and that slowly I am trying to raise it into consciousness with your help so that we can see how such disparate things as planetary crisis, shamanism, hallucinogenic plants, higher dimensional mappings of complex phase spaces, how all of these things somehow feed into each other and create uh, a position a new position from which to carry out a critique of uh, planetary life and society, which is uh, what we need. So I'm just going to run down this list of themes, say a little bit about each of them, and, uh, and then leave you to cook that overnight. And then tomorrow and the next day, we'll try to tease this out. It's, uh, well, I'm either sinking into delusion or I'm figuring it out more and more. And what I need to know from you is, which is it? I'd rather hear it from you than the New York Times book reviewer, let me tell you. So uh, this, is, uh, this is where we do the prototype uh, Okay, Planetary Crisis heads the list. Uh, I can't remember what this thing was called in the catalog, but I write these things so many months in advance that it's just a hook anyway. What I have thought of this month's dialogues at Esalen, of which this will be the culmination and the distillation, is understanding the chaos at history's end. Now, there are different contradictions and, uh, and uh, adumbrations of meaning in that. The old understanding of chaos was that it is that which cannot be understood. That's what chaos means. It was thought of as the antithesis of cosmos. And in Greek, these two things are perceived as opposites, chaos and cosmos. Cosmos means order. Chaos means uh, disorder. However, uh, taking a page from my friend Ralph Abraham, I sort of propose that we think of this as a meeting of the Henri Poincaré uh, Anarchist International Brigade and take as our motto, chaos is order. This is uh, the great truth under which anarchy has always marched. And uh, I think it's never truer than today. So the goal of the weekend is to understand chaos, to understand that which cannot be understood within the confines of the uh, old paradigm. And then I called it understanding chaos at history's end to shock us into examining the notion of history's end, into thinking about the possibility that this huge context in which we have been embedded for thousands of years now is in fact provisional, temporary, and about to be superseded by an entirely different order of being. And we'll talk about how can this be, what could it be, and what can uh, we do about it. You see, primitive as our uh, level of uh, epistemic description of the world is, nevertheless, if we were to arrive on this planet and find it exactly as it is, except empty of human life or artifacts, then 
with our chemistry, with our physics, with our biology, with our systems theory, we would feel comfortable with what we found. And we would say, this is a, a living planet, a planet with, bio, with biological life on it, great herds of ungulate animals and climaxed rainforests and uh, indemnified island uh, biota and so forth. In other words, we can understand a planet covered with life, or at least we have the illusion of it. But what we confront in the phenomenon of our own planet is a planet covered by intelligence and swarming with uh, information transfer that is not genetic, but epigenetic in the form of books, codes, statuary, dance, ritual, electronic signal transfer, so forth and so on. And sophisticated though we may imagine ourselves to be, we have no basis for understanding the circumstances that we confront on our own planet. You have to really be able to make a leap to faith, I think, to believe that human spiritual uh, emergence, the emergence of human consciousness as practiced by ourselves, is something that could emerge in 50,000 years out of selective pressure on a population of anthropoid apes. I mean, this is the great leap to faith that science asks us to take to see ourselves as somehow uh, emerging in an orderly fashion out of the background of nature. This is highly trying to credibility. And the more we study evolution, the more unlikely this scenario appears because evolution proceeds extremely slowly and in response to selective pressure from the outside. But something happened to us uh, in the past million years that caused our previously stabilized brain size to double almost overnight. The coordination of bipedal motion, binocular vision, complex pack hunting systems of signaling, so forth and so on, is not entirely sufficient to explain the peculiar presence of self-reflecting, epigenetically coding philosophy and art producing human beings on this planet. So there is a puzzle, and the puzzle is ourselves. We don't seem to fit in. We seem to be uh, the unique uh, construct in the natural world. Why is this, number one, is this so, or is it a, a, a product of misperception, ignorance, or false interpretation? Or if it is so, then what does that mean? What is history? What is it that is acting on us to propel us in such a short time out of the matrix of organic nature and into a matrix of our own creation? the world of culture and epigenetic coding systems and uh, the human imagination as created by the modality of language. What is it that is pushing us uh, in this direction? Well, uh, mostly tonight I'm going to pose questions and then we'll work out or work toward answers tomorrow. One of the things that I think, I don't know how many of you are sensitive to the subtler issues of evolutionary theory, but one of the things that I've come up against in writing this book I'm working on is that um, something very fundamental has been left out of the theory of human origins or the picture of the situation that surrounded human origins. And this was... Uh, the impact of an omnivorous diet on the human genome. You see, we had been uh, fruititarian arboreal primates who, because of climactic change 
uh, on the African continent were forced down onto the grasslands which were spreading as the forest shrank and a number of changes were in play at that point but the one I want to mention here now is the fact that we began to experiment with our diet we needed to expand our repertoire of foods well most animals eat only a very few kinds of foods the omnivorous adaptation is quite rare why because a, an animal with an omnivorous dietary habit is exposing itself to untold numbers of mutagens toxins and poisons in the environment and exposing yourself to mutagenic influences uh, is usually a bad evolutionary strategy because what it does is it causes mutation it causes a sudden expansion in the number of mutations available for natural selection to do its work upon and the number of mutations available to the process of, na of natural selection is going to, that number is going to have a direct effect on a number which comes out of the equation over here, the number of successful mutations, true, true, true breeding mutations which actually confer an adaptive advantage. And one of the great puzzles about looking at human beings against the background of the other higher primates is why the uh, hairlessness, why the prolonged adolescence, uh, and why language? What was the pressure on this? And uh, what we will talk about is the influence of psychoactive compounds in the early human diet, the kind of society that that may have put in place, which I will argue, and this is for me a step forward, I, I now am absolutely convinced that what is happening is that we had a relationship to psychoactive plants in prehistory that was so tight so necessary to our own social organization and well-being that for all practical purposes we have to think of it as a symbiosis not simply that we used a plant but that this plant became scripted into our life in a way such that when climatological change and migrations and this sort of thing broke up made that relationship impossible we fell into history we became neurotic we are in a sense the children of a dysfunctional relationship that we have forgotten all about and I will talk more I think than I've ever talked about it before this weekend about addiction and bad drugs because in working on this book I've had to come to terms with the fact that bad drugs have been a major part of the human story. What is it about human beings that sends them searching frantically through the natural world for a fix? And uh, it's an expanded adaptation. We don't only uh, addict to plants and chemicals. We addict to each other, to ideas, to patterns of behavior, to things. We just addict, actually there's nothing you can think of that humans do not form addictions to. And this peculiar tendency to have behavior patterns become locked in such a way that their disruption causes a negative uh, feedback into the physical organism is something that we're very uncomfortable with. Uh, you know, it's only in the last hundred years that we've overcome our discomfort about the fact that we are sexual creatures and that we live a life of highly evolved and ever-present sexual fantasy. This was very, very hard for the Victorians to come to terms with. 
I mean, they, after all, put trousers on their piano stools. And you can imagine, if you're coming from that to uh, a, a full examination of the contents of the human psyche on the subject of sexuality, that it's going to be quite shocking. In the same way now with talk of drug wars and, you know, destroying the Constitution so that people won't be able to smoke pot and all this stuff, clearly we are in a state of high agitation over a part of ourselves that we can't come to terms with and integrate, which is the fact that we are uh, such addictive creatures. Well, I will try to convince you that this has to do with this trauma in prehistory when we underwent a withdrawal from the primary symbiote that was holding us in a kind of social equilibrium with nature that we now can only dream about and call paradise or uh, a golden age. And I'll give you the terms and the details on all of this uh, tomorrow. The other thing, and remember I said these things may appear disparate and disconnected, but I now see them as a seamless manifold. Uh, it's written on my pad as unraveling the presence of the transcendental object. Now what this means is uh, I don't simply advocate the use of psychedelic plants because I think they make us feel good and break down social barriers and patterns of habit and so forth, although they do all that. But I believe that perception itself tends to um, take the shape of its vessel. You know, the alchemists visualized mind as mercury and mercury being a liquid will always flow to the lowest level and take the shape of the vessel. And I think that in the, in the potential multiple dimensional space of being, mind has flowed to the lowest levels of the vessel. And that what happens when we perturb the mind-brain system with hallucinogenic uh, indoles is uh, it's as though we were to vaporize the mercury and instead of taking the shape of the vessel at its lowest levels as a liquid the mercury fills the vessel as a pressurized gas and what this experience is is uh, a seeing of higher dimension literally, not metaphorically. This is what has to be understood. That you literally are seeing a higher dimension to reality. And um, Ralph Abraham was here yesterday suggesting that because the world is such a complex system, it has many, many variables dimension, which seems like a word that people shrink from because it has some aura of mathematics about it, is not a difficult concept at all. Think of, dim of a dimension simply as a variable. So if I tell you that we have eight variables, then we have an eight-dimensional phase space in which whatever we're talking about is going on. Well, obviously the number of variables in the natural and human world is very high. So the degree to which we can perturb the mind out of its slovenly tendency to flow to the lower dimensions of the lattice and instead urge it to expand into the higher orders of the phase space, then we get a fuller picture of reality. Because I, I, it seems quite reasonable to me to say that what we call reality is a lower dimensional slice of a higher dimensional phase space. And we slice this higher dimension with the knife of language. 
Well, then we get a cross-section, like slicing through an agate or slicing through a fruit. Then we see the interior of it, but we do not see the seed from which it came, the tree which grew it, the death of that tree. In other words, the temporal dimension, to name but one, is not visible in the lower dimensional slice made by the knife of language. So we have to either create a higher dimensional language or use more than one language at once or create some other strategy for handling all these variables. What shamanism is, is a person who can go into these higher dimensions and understand enough of what they're seeing that for them it functions as a map of the lower dimensional world into which they are going to return. You've, many of you have heard me say, a shaman is someone who has seen the end. Well, this is just a, a kind of cute way of saying that the shaman has experienced the temporal dimension as a totality. The shaman has seen the beginning and the end. And that's what gives the shaman his or her peculiar psychic equilibrium. Because they're not like you and me groping along down here in four-dimensional space uh, trying to figure it out. For them, it's all of a piece. And this feeds back into their personality as a tremendous kind of authenticity. Well, we need to shamanize to save the planet. We need to create higher dimensional mappings of our world and the crisis in which we are in in order to plot a way out of the cul-de-sac that the phonetic alphabet, monotheism, and print-created uh, linear monoculture has shoved us into. So the psychedelics are not ancillary, they're not peripheral, they're not secondary. They are the way to propel ourselves into these higher dimensional phase spaces. Eventually we will drag our computers with us, but you can't push the computer first because the computer must be programmed by people who have seen these things and know what they are uh, shooting for. What this process will inevitably become is uh, pressure on the evolution of language. Because you see, even though in the last few minutes I've presented it to you in a kind of imperative mode, where I'm saying, this is what we need to do, this is what we should do, this is what we will do. As a matter of fact, this is what we have been doing, and for a very long time as well. In fact, the entire progress of biology and culture, anthropology, can be seen as a kind of conquest of dimensionality that has occurred at an ever-accelerating rate so that, you know, the earliest organisms were just literally groped their way through life. They couldn't see light or darkness. They rubbed up against something, and that's how they knew it was there. And then, through evolutionary selection, light-sensitive pigmented spots appeared on the surfaces of these things. And that gave them a gradient of sensation that told them the difference between light and darkness. Well, a further coordination of this ability, a, a further differentiation of this light-dark gradient gives eyes and the visual world. At the same time, that this is happening, uh, organs of motility are evolving. Well, now, meaning that so animals can move around more freely. They're not like algae or something stuck on rocks. Well, notice that when an animal, an animal that can move is already a master of a whole set of dimensions that are completely invisible to a creature which cannot move, let's say a sea anemone. What do sea anemones know of the fear of flying? 
You know, they don't know anything about it because for them the world is not put together that way. But a gazelle coordinates itself in a higher dimensional space than the sea anemone. Similarly, once you reach the place in evolution where uh, language appears, language is a way of destroying the primacy of the moment. In other words, pushing out from this very narrow domain called now into an anticipation of the future based on an extrapolation and analysis of the past. This is a conquest of dimensionality, adding variables, you see. And then when you go into the realm of epigenetic coding, huge databases so that nothing is ever forgotten, in a way the past ceases to fall away. The past is co-present with the present in a world where there is high-speed information and data retrieval. So similarly, in our present circumstance then, what we are pushing against is the, um, the envelope of the dimensionality of language. Language has hitherto been allowed to grow like uh, Flopsy or Mopsy or one of them. Uh, in any case, it has not been uh, thought of as a process which could be guided by cultural engineering. But I think this has to be done if we are going to make the changes necessary to be made in the time that we have to make them. So we'll talk a lot about language and the evolution of language and what it actually is. Um, and then finally, to bring it all together and to try and tie it up, we will try and understand how this symbiosis that was lost in prehistory can be regained from where we are without shattering the entire print-created, dominator, phonetic alphabet, Judeo-Christian shtick. Because, you know, we've, we're in this funny place. It's like a cusp. I mean, visualize a surface which looks like a cross-section of a curling wave where you walk up this surface and you get to the top of the hill and you walk here. Well, right here, this is the lip of the wave. You can't walk any further. You fall down to a surface down here that is a completely different part of the manifold. This is called a cusp in dynamics. And you move along and it's a smooth curve and a smooth curve. And then there is a perturbation, what René Tom and his school called a catastrophe. And at the catastrophe point, you fall off the manifold and you fall through God knows what, and then you land somewhere else on the manifold. And this is how stock market crashes occur, how uh, unexpected uh, any things occur, and it is the kind of situation that we are in. We cannot extrapolate the future hundreds and hundreds of years. That is not, that is the least realistic of all future scenarios. And anybody who talks about how we're going to take care of X, Y, or Z in a hundred or two hundred years is just living with a 17th century model of how historical processes work. Because history for thousands of years has pushed toward the kind of super self-transforming momentum that we now have. We have, we are up to takeoff speed. And in fact, the end of the runway is ahead of us. We don't have a choice about takeoff. We have reached takeoff speed and now there is nothing left to do but grab the stick and pull it back and close your eyes and hope. Because if we don't make that 
commitment to the planetary process, the end of the runway is 35 years in front of us. I mean, that's it. There is no more. So there has to be a, a, uh, a uh, perturbation, a Tomian catastrophe that hurls us into an entirely new cultural milieu. Well, I maintain that the catalysts for this have been present on the earth for eons and that culture has taken a vacation into dominator models and egocentric models and materialistic models and models which flatten and simplify and distort and uh, suck life out of reality that you know we are seeing what the Faustian price we had to pay for the terrific understanding of matter that the tools of Greek science have betrayed into our hands. Yes, we can bring the power which lights the stars and ignite it in the deserts of our planet and if necessary ignite it over the cities of our real or imagined enemies. Yes, we can generate the bare-bottomed quark in machines a mile and a half across that use as much electricity as is produced in the entire United States for a few seconds, we have gained a tremendous facility over matter. And in our naivete, when we made that Faustian pact uh, back there around the time of Thales, we didn't realize that the price would be to lose contact with our souls. And this is what we have done. And now we cannot find it. And now we need it. We need some kind of larger vector field into which to cast the human situation so that we can see a way out of the mess that we have created. Well, I maintain the only way this can be done is by a return to the situation in prehistory. This is what I call the archaic revival that history is to be seen as the peregrination of a kind of prodigal son, and that now the peregrination must end. The prodigal son, who is Western humankind, and the epistemic tools that we have developed, must now return to the human family outside of history which means the people who have been in the rainforests and on the Arctic tundra, they never left it. They kept the knowledge of this hyperdimensional phase space, but for them it was always a domain of uh, magic, mystery, and uncertainty. We actually bring something new to it. I am not saying that we must simply return to the old ways, that I think we have something which can enrich the old ways, that what we have learned about languages, about mathematics particularly, this is what we perfected. Our pride is not in our science, which is destructive, toxic, and childish. Our pride is in our mathematics, which is an intimation of the transdimensional object that is outside of historical phase space and that casts an enormous flickering shadow over the human enterprise. It is through mathematics, through first of all the probability theory, more recently things like uh, fractals and dynamic modeling, it is through these things that we are able to give uh, a kind of empirical grounding to our visions. Because what, what we see in our visions is not hallucinations. What we see in our visions is the higher truth. And we have never faced this. In fact, this is what we repress. Hallucinations are devalued. The phenomena of the mind are called uh, subjective. This is a knock 
You know, when you call something subjective, it means it's inconsequential or it's a matter of opinion. We don't realize the primacy of mind. So our value systems are in need of reconstruction. I think what lies ahead for us as a planetary culture, once the um, agenda of the archaic revival is fully and in place, as it must inevitably be, is uh, a culture reared in the imagination. That this is what the appetition for completion in the realm of epigenetic coding and art and engineering and thought and poetry, all this will coalesce into a domain of art. This is what hyperspace is, you see. Novelty becomes so concrest that there can be no more of it in historical space-time. And so it begins to pour into an orthogonal dimension nearby in the same way that matter in the center of a black hole forces its way into another universe. At a certain level of compaction, of, uh, of the novelty, it can go nowhere else but into a new dimension. Anticipating this is not easy because we are constantly operating in this lower dimensional slice. But uh, as a community of many minds that have taken many snapshots of this other world, made many journal entries, scrawled many crude maps of the terrain, I think we can put it all together and begin to get a feeling for what, uh, for what this thing is, for how it works, for how it can feed back into the historical uh, crisis. I have the faith that there's no, sol no situation that can be viewed as a problem in which the solution is not immediately to be found present at hand. And, uh, you know, before hallucinogens were called hallucinogens or psychedelics, they were called consciousness-expanding drugs or consciousness-expanding substances. If there's any iota of truth in that notion, that these things expand consciousness, then we have to have it. Because it is for the dearth of consciousness that we are going mad. We have the money. We have the technologies. We have the uh, understanding of, of uh, ecosystems and natural chemistry and the atmosphere. What we lack is the moral will to do anything about it. We are like frozen. We cannot seem to reach into the control mechanisms of ourselves as a species and have any impact. I mean, how do you get George Bush trotting on this agenda? It just doesn't seem to be possible. Well, um, it's slow work, but I think we're making progress. Some of you may know the concept of, of meme of a meme. Do you all know this idea? No. A meme is the smallest unit of an idea. It is to an idea what a gene is to protein. You need to understand about what we're doing here. We're spreading a meme. These are the meme wars of the 90s that are looming. And uh, at last I found an argument for just like a gene, it can be copied by telling somebody something, by telling a bunch of somebody something, or by repeating yourself. This is how you copy a meme. You spread a meme by leaving the copies of it around in the form of books and tapes and conversations. Well, these memes, uh, the Intellect, the phase space of ideology can be conceived of as an environment, just like a rainforest. 
So these memes run around and furiously compete with each other. And natural selection acts upon the competing populations of memes, and some die, and some occupy niche after niche and adapt themselves so that they're comfortable with managers and psychiatrists and priests and go-go dancers, and that's a successful meme. It's making itself useful to everybody. For instance, there is the meme of a free press, the idea that free press is a good thing. This meme is now very popular and spreading wildly. At the same moment, the meme of Marxism is shriveling and melting and just dissipating in the presence of the free press meme. Clearly, uh, the Marxist meme cannot compete in an environment where free press memes are running around. And I believe that in the same way that natural selection upon genes produced levels of integrated organization and beauty that human beings can never hope to surpass, such as a rose or an orchid or a volcano, that uh, if we simply launch our memes into the environment of ideological competition, that natural selection will do its work. You, some of you may remember last fall I went around saying the best idea will win. Well, this is why. I mean, I, I usually get the end first and then the mechanism follows. This is why the best idea will win. So the obligation on us is to communicate. You know, the caterpillar in Alice in Wonderland says, say what you mean and mean what you say. I do. And I think this is excellent advice for all of us. We want to spread memes among ourselves. This is the opposite of safe sex. We want to, it, people say enthusiasm is infectious. Well, so is understanding. It can be taught, it can be shared, it can be replicated. And I believe, and I hope not uh, erroneously, that the psychedelic meme is going to have another replay. It almost died in its form as uh, an LSD rock concert that would wrest power from the establishment and beat it over the head with it. In that form, the psychedelic meme met very large fish that were completely capable of gobbling it down, and its population shrank accordingly. And, and it's almost was in the background, but mutation has now taken place in the psychedelic meme. It has a new face and a new form. It no longer exhorts crowds of hundreds of thousands of people to march out of their offices and universities and copulate in the streets. Now it meets in small groups like this and urges psychotherapists to consider the possibility that shamanism might have a model that would be useful in delivering mental health care to people. The meme has grown smarter the meme has adapted itself uh, to the larger environment of competing memes. And at the same time, memes which were suppressing the psychedelic meme have themselves grown old, tired, slightly atrophied in their responses, slightly exhausted with their own successes. So as we go through this weekend, uh, I want you to think of it, as I do, very consciously as a process of meme replication and infection. And the idea is that when we're done, each one of you is to be a kind of ideological typhoid Mary who will go back to Cleveland and Kokomo and wherever and, uh, and talk to people and 
get people replicating this meme, wondering and thinking, because I'm convinced on a level playing field, in the presence of a free press, uh, this thing has a great potential to just break away and, uh, and remake the world. Uh, and the reason that it has that potential is because the situation is now very desperate. Uh, even the establishment memes are willing to negotiate if there's a possibility that there are any new answers here. The establishment feels much less confident of its own meme than it did in the 1970s. So what I'm going to present to you over the weekend is an argument from prehistory toward post-history that tries to make sense of what fell between, which was this lightning strike of religions, inventions, works of art, outbursts of poetry, cruelty, genius, mysticism, and humanity that precedes our fusion with the transcendental cultural object which we will create which we will summon out of the collectivity of human imagination and the Gaian mind that uh, rules the planet so ably and so well. For the moment, however, I urge you to have a soak in the baths and get some sleep and we'll meet here tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, it's a little bit early. If anybody has any questions, uh, other people should feel free to leave. A lot of people have come a long way. But is anybody just absolutely burning with a question, or can you cook it? Yes. Uh, at some point, I would like to hear your thoughts on people. I have thoughts on people from my generation who have experimented with mind expanded drugs, and now I have a child and children that I know that are in their late teens and early twenties that have done the same thing. And the connection between us as people and, and you know what I see happening to them and their awareness of what is going on on a whole other level of consciousness that I didn't have. Yes, I will talk about this. I mean, I have two children of my own. They're both within range of my stentorian voice at this moment, so there are no secrets. Uh, but this is, a, this is a real question in a society that has completely lost any contact with tradition. How do you pass this thing on? I mean, we all feel it to be tremendously important to our uh, well-being, it's very much like sex. I mean, how do you pass that on to your children? You're not going to be there when they do it. But you hope, you know, that you set them up for it. Yes, and all the rest of you should feel uh, free to follow this woman's example. If there are areas that you want concentrated on, uh, feminism, fractal mathematics, all of these things have a part to play in it. Why guide me? Uh, because I can always use it. I'm, I enjoy these things most when they are driven by uh, the questions that it all raises in the audience. Uh, it should be very interactive and it should be very good. It's, uh, it's coming out of the collective and we all are both antennas to and broadcast stations for the collective. One other thing I just might say, I suppose it's obvious, but from my point of view, the importance of these meetings, much of it rests in how you relate to each other. I mean, look around you. We cannot be told from the rest of them. 
we look just like the rest of them. So the only way we can never recognize each other is by self-selecting ourselves and crowding into a room to hear one of our number speak these forbidden truths. So take this opportunity to get to know the other people who cared as much as you did about this to be here, because I'm sure you can, without any aid from me, plan all kinds of mischief among yourselves after you leave here. <laughs> Got it? Okay. See you in the morning. Oh, Richard, yeah. No, but I'm told I should and I shall. I shall. Have you seen Baron Munchausen? Yes. You should and shall. <laughs> okay, we'll see you in the morning. Uh, enjoy Esalen. Uh, you can get, I don't know if they told you this in orientation, but down by the big house is a staircase that goes down to the beach. They aren't really afraid of the sea here. There is a way down to the beach and it's spectacular. Uh, there's a little round house with a dolphin made out of our baloney shells on top of it as you go down toward the bridge over the river. That is a meditation chapel. You can go there and meditate anytime. It's open to everyone. Um, I'm just mentioning these two places because they're good to know about and they're not particularly stressed. Don't miss this walk down to the beach, down this staircase. I mean, it's really spectacular over there. You go across the bridge, through the garden, down the hill, across the bridge, and then you'll see a large house. That's called the big house. Go there and then just go around to the other side of the big house as though you were exploring its gardens. And there are a series of descending levels that will channel you down to the beach. And uh, we'll begin here at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning.